All right, good evening. We're going to get started. Good evening, I'm Mike Lewitter. I'm a librarian here at the college. I'm also the college archivist. And I'd like to welcome you to our library for tonight's poetry reading. Uh, this evening, Katie Kalish will read from her book, Quiet Woman. Uh, the library has a long history of hosting poetry readings, and we're really privileged to include Katie as one of the poets who have read here. Tonight's program is co-sponsored by the uh, Library and Learning Commons, as well as the GRCC English Department. Uh, I'd like to thank the library staff who helped make tonight's reading possible, especially Nan Schichtel, Lori DeBee, Tony Harrington, and Nikki Neinheist. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to mention that we've uh, put together a display of Katie, some of Katie's works, and uh, the, we also have a card of books of uh, other Michigan poets that can be checked out uh, downstairs. After the reading, Katie will be available to uh, sign copies of her book, which may be purchased for $14. Uh, there are also signed copies of this broadside available that you can get your hands on. Uh, finally, if you parked in the student lot right across the street, we can validate your parking for you before you leave. So now I'm happy to introduce Marianne Lassert. She's Associate Professor of English here at the college, who will provide some background on and introduce our speaker. So please help me welcome Marianne Lassert. Well, welcome everybody. This is a really, really happy occasion from one writer to another. Um, it's always just such a great, great celebration with a first book. So when Katie told me her book was going to be published, I said, celebrate, right? <laughs> it's the first thing I said, celebrate. You'll be very busy soon. Well, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce tonight a friend and colleague, professor of English, and a poet of incredible grace and relentless observation, Katie Kalish. <laughs> From her book jacket and website, um, there are words of praise for Quiet Woman, and I'd like to read a few of those. From Deirdre Fagan comes Kalish's poems are eggs, protected and refined, precariously occupying the vast landscape between hatched and cracked. And from Joy Gaines Friedler, quiet woman reminds us of life's extraordinary contradictions and how effortless love can sometimes be. And finally, in the words of Alan Michael Parker, these are hymns that hum of human endeavor, motherhood and its fears, and the resplendent pleasures of family life. What I hear in Katie's poetry as she examines issues as powerful as birth, death, love, alongside more everyday moments and movements, is a tendency that environmental ethicist and essayist Kathleen Dean Moore calls the ecology of love. Being present to place, to the aches and joys of the ones we love, to the power of interconnection, even when moments of growth or those ecological edges scrape us clean, is an act of love, an act of giving life. Katie's poetry makes me want to be a better listener of life. And I can feel, as I read her poems, a sense of her work cultivating my own abilities. In closing, and before I get our featured speaker up to this podium, I'd like to read you a comment from one of Katie's recent creative writing students, because here at GRCC, we are known as teacher practitioners, and she certainly fully embodies that role. So in her students' words, she consistently pushed our work towards something specific, more visceral. Her passion and her delight for discovering the best way to communicate something profound or silly or soulful to the world really made the class special. 
we're all in for all of the above tonight. So please join me with a rousing celebration for the release of Quiet Woman and welcome Katie Kalish to the podium. Gosh, thank you, Marianne. That was unexpected. I mean, I just saw you in the hallway yesterday. <laughs> Didn't know you had all that planned to say. <laughs> My husband said that I should just like start with a poem the way like you, some musicians do, but I said I can't pull that off. So um, I do want to say thanks, echo some of the thanks that um, Mike gave. There you are. Um, so thank you, Mike, for creating this, this nice um, display. And for um, thanks to Nan, who's not here today, but she did a lot. Thank you to Lori. And thanks to Marianne, of course, and Dave Cope for your support through this journey. Um, and also to all of my English department colleagues for seeing my annoying face <laughs> on all the posters around campus. <laughs> You're very kind. Um, OK, so this poem is one that I, um, I usually just start with. It's always the first one. It's kind of like the icebreaker, I guess. Um, so the title is Apology to My Vegan Brother for the Leather Satchel I Gave You Last Christmas. Soft and broken in, the caramel hide was sumptuous. Fine meat or rich cheese. And perhaps I was hungry when I ran my hand over its messenger style flap in the store that December. Your girlfriend's face told me what I should have known, but still cannot translate fluently. Forgive me as I wonder how you can stop from eating off my plate at dinner's out now, and how I am to bake you a cake without eggs. Since I did not travel the long way west when you finished college, did not repay you for being the youngest the only boy during my female childhood. I searched for a practical and lavish gift to settle my debts. Do you have the same resourceful memory of dad plucking the feathers from waterfowl, saving for us the webbed feet, the wings of teal, purple, and silver, majesty from his accomplished hunts? How effortless love can sometimes seem. Um, this next poem <clears throat> uh, says a lot about my childhood, <laughs> um, and it was it was exciting last year because I got an acceptance letter from um, it's called Gray's Sporting Journal. Any Gray's readers here? You don't often find people who subscribe to that and poets at the same place, but my dad subscribed to that, um, and so I grew up with that all the time, and they started publishing poems, one poem in the back of every issue. And I thought, I can get a poem in there with my childhood. So this was written for that. And then they accepted it, but they never published it. So it's kind of, yeah, got a sad ending. But the poem, the poem is still here. The poem still lives. It's called Subdividing. When women unwrap protected shoulders from woolen scarves that keep out the cold, I think of undressing animals skinning squirrels my father shot. I held the front feet tight while he pulled the hide down toward the tail, pulled off trousers of coarse black fur. He hung a buck from the rafters in the small barn, my brother and sister and I taking turns, guessing what breakfast had been, the size of the still warm heart. Summers filled with delicate bones of silver trout, Winters froze sour slime and thawed it each spring, pungent olive slush. Seasons shifted the way water can turn from rain to ice to steam. We stewed, fried, smoked, brined, scraped fat from a deer's bloodlet body and packed it into suet bags for winter birds. Kept the spawn and female fish for future bait. For my son's preschool graduation, we accepted an old beaver's skull with a thread of dental floss through an eye socket, 
one tooth that curls out an inch and a half if you pull on it. We push it back in, store this gift in Tupperware in the pantry, alongside turkey feet with clenched claws. I pile walnuts there too, green and lemon scented, turning hard as they shrink. Um, this is my first book, but I figure you're supposed to read the title poem, right? I'm assuming that's something that you would expect. So this is the title poem. Although the, the title of this poem is Quiet Women, and the book is Quiet Woman, not a typo. Just a suggestion. Um, so you can ask me about that later if you really want to know. Quiet Women. Down we work toward darker territory, ripping apart capillaries, still purple as courage, blood-filled. Quiet women pick bones of animals clean, relieve the sockets of their sweetness, oily meat. We pick berries, squatting in silence on burning haunches, with anticipation of jams and pies, outdoing the next row over. Quiet women can hunt for the strawberry so red, it looks blue. We keep private our memories of perfection. The table set for Christmas dinner, fit of a baby's round skull in a palm, the sensation of sleep. After children and guests leave, we straighten ties and beds, curtains, our own slips beneath skirts glances that might have strayed when we were little girls learning. Um, so uh, this next poem is, some, is a, it's a kind of poem that I teach in my um, creative writing classes. It's like found poetry and for poets, um, I, at least for this poet, I'm always worried that somebody's going to see it as stealing or cheating. <laughs> um, and the, the, this poem comes from the barter section of Craigslist, which is um, kind of like a constant poem. There's always a poem there if you, if you ever go. Like literally, you could look it up on your phone right now, and it might be better than my poem. <laughs> um, but it's, a, it's so interesting, the kind of like exchange that people think is... Um, equal, like what they're offering for what they want. Um, and so a lot of this is not written by me. It's just sort of lineated by me. Um, at the end of the poem, it kind of blends into a, a walk in my neighborhood and a conversation that, um, that I had with some neighbors and that turned out to be also a kind of bartering. Um, but most of this, I did not write the best line in the poem. So I'm always worried when I read it, like, Somebody's going to be sitting there and be like, that's my line. <laughs> and it's in your book. So I hope that doesn't happen today. Although now it's on, it's recorded too, so I'm screwed. <clears throat> Barter section of Craigslist and beyond, Grand Rapids, Michigan, late summer. My truck for your bike or what you got? I will snowplow you if you feed me and clean my house. Your triple question mark could get you my bass boat. This handyman ex-husband of mine for your camper. <laughs> also, four-piece king-size bedroom set for a good car and National Atlas. We want new laminate, you want a draft beer cooler. <laughs> Be the envy of all your friends with your very own draft beer system. The Pacific Ocean, make me an offer. <laughs> Hostas for more daisies. Snap-on toolbox, green, for two-seater dune buggy. Wife's soap for two goats, photo upon request. You agree not to vote for him, and I will give you my TV. <laughs> my wife for yours. Need a ride? Accepting baked goods, sweet, for carpooling service. Juicy red tomatoes, homegrown, just picked, for your sympathy and time. We had to put our girl down this week. See our new puppy? 
How old is your dog? Please stay longer to talk if you take the tomatoes. What have you got to rush home for? My story for some of that good stuff. So I will encourage you, I'll invite all of you to write a Craigslist poem tonight. Um, let's see here. I think the next one I'll read is um, the, the one that you all have as the broadside. Um, since it is February, the month of love, we thought this was an appropriate one to um, hand out. And didn't, didn't um, the graphic designers here do such a nice job with it? I was so happy and pleased with it. Love poem. We are past the gestures encouraged by magazines and morning talk show hosts. I clean the dirt from your index finger while we drive silently to a doctor's appointment after an argument that neither of us won, unwinnable. You sigh in pleasure while driving us. I inhale your sweet garlic breath, blink my eyes clean, swallow back the remains of tears I could cry. There is no need. We separate our clasped hands in order to open our separate doors. The morning dew reveals footpaths of others across the grass hurrying. We take the sidewalk's right angles, turning by heart in unison, although we have not been exactly here before. Um, so I tried to break the poems I'm reading for you tonight into kind of some batches or groups. Batches makes them sound like cookies. Um, and the next kind of segment I want to share with you a few of um, are what I refer to in my head as like kid poems or I guess motherhood poems. Um, so when I was finishing my MFA or during my MFA, I had two of my three children. And I'm sure that that somehow really, um, I know that that really Im impacted my writing to be creating during that time. And just, uh, it was such a life-changing time, of course. So um, among other things uh, that was life-changing was um, taking small children to funerals, which forced me to confront this, this really big contrast, obviously, of new life and death. And when you have little kids, little tiny kids, that's what you do. You take them with you when you have to go to a funeral. And so um, I had that experience uh, multiple times. And I'm going to share some of those, a couple of those poems. Two. You can endure two, right? It's not that depressing. Um, so this first one is uh, called Viewing at the 14-Year-Old Girl's Wake. You were in my arms or your father's as we ambled around in search of a portal where she might be resting safe, since we could not help but think of you in her place. While she lay at the front of the room, we kept our distance, saw her only peripherally, our earlier fears drowned by the constant stream of visitors. In the center of the open room, you became a distraction, something to inspect, gathering the mourners to your small feet, large eyes, four-month-old heart and lungs like a scenic overlook, a historic place. As we watched her, they watched you, each breath of yours their gasp, each blink a bridge. Um, this next one opens the book, and it's also the one that um, the, was on another broadside um, from the Michigan poet, and it's called Pregnant at a Funeral. While glassy-eyed attendants stretched in rhythmic lines past his taut mother in the front pew, I tried to imagine the nearly grown child inside of me dying before I did. Soft jabs to the tender skin beneath my rib cage 
assured me of some faceless life and heartbeat still beating, for the moment listening to sobs and sighs. I quietly pictured your possible names on a gray headstone, on a folded memorial program, on a kiosk with directions to the funeral luncheon in your honor. Undecided, I followed the mass of visitors into the church basement, lined up for single slice ham sandwiches on damp white buns, three versions of potato salad, two red punch or wheat coffee. I made small talk while you ate away at what I could give you now, this small pause before death starts chasing you back here. Um, the next one, while still a kid poem, is a little lighter. So you can all breathe. Um, and I've read this one, I think, quite a bit. But um, I like reading this one. So I hope you enjoy it, too. It's called The Bachelor's Groceries. It still happens to me. This is based on a true story. I examine his conveyor, conveyor belt items for condoms, but all that appear are a quart of whole milk, toothpaste, paper plates, plastic forks, preformed hamburger patties, shaving cream. As he stands ahead of me in line, reading email on his smartphone, I loft tired gazes over the frantic tabloid headlines. Woman entombed, heaven photographed by manned telescope. Alien mother eats her young. He pays with crisp bills that have not been crumpled by small children. He does not have any coupons, bottle slips, or gift cards. Neither his meat nor his milk are bought with WIC money, and he never looks behind to see the face of the child who is crying to his back. I puzzle over what he has not purchased, buns, bananas or tomatoes, toilet paper, dish soap, bulk rate supplies. When he walks away with his one bag, I want to follow him, ride fast in his uncluttered car, windows open, and no one asking me to roll them up, then down, and over and over again. Um, so this next poem I've never read out loud, but um, uh, it is, um, fr so let me think, how should I say this? Marianne and I, um, Marianne introduced me to um, Pierce Cedar Creek, and um, which is a institute south of town, kind of by Hastings, it's great. And um, we did some writing there together on retreat, and there's lots of hiking and everything. And um, on one of our hikes, the, uh, there was a sign, and, um, and the, the sign was describing an esker. And um, well, Marianne probably already knew what that was. But I learned what that word was that day. And um, I think after that hike, we went back and we were writing about it um, kind of separately. And I remember we said something like, it'd be, it'd be interesting to see what you wrote about it versus what I wrote about it. So um, this is my Esker poem, Marianne. I'm sharing it with you and everyone else here. Um, and so do you all know what an Esker is? Is this a stupid question? OK, good. I didn't know either. I actually had to look it up today, because I have a sense of what it is, but I don't know how to say it. So um, it is like a ridge, kind of like a railroad. It almost is like the. Um, like the White Pine Trail, like it looks like a railroad type of, an old railroad grade, a, a winding ridge that is created when a glacier retreats, right? Okay, close enough? Um, so this poem is called Esker. And um, as you'll hear, I, uh, I was um, having this word on my mind while this other thing was happening. And so in my head, they became linked. The same week my 11-month-old son grew his molars, 
My grandfather had all the teeth pulled out of his mouth. He sat, drugged but furious, in the artificial air of his South Florida condo in a gated community that regulated his garage door opening, closing. My son wailed with the ache, his red gums swollen and his eyes searching my face for something like a conspiracy. During dinner, both small hands pounded at his cheeks, trying to locate the source of the dull punctures, new mountains he would always take for granted. An early version of the tired man he might become, the pain mashed up his blonde brows, his still and yielding skin. My grandfather had time to prepare for his appointment, a week off from his blood thinner, clearance from all of his other specialists. Such permission, not for a field trip or a marriage, but for an extraction. I wonder if he thought of killing himself. While I rubbed teething gel on my son, his mouth a clamp on my index finger, his face a sour shape, I thought of my grandfather sitting, sipping his scotch, his mouth a wrinkled prune, a valley where glaciers once carved a face. All right, one more of these kid poems. Um, Uh, this next one is called Apology to My Daughter Ahead of Time. When you arrived late as a package prodded across a wide country, dropped into foreign hands without a stamp of approval, of entry, I did not know what to do. How? Where was the border crossing? And who permitted me entrance? Or was it exit? But this is an apology. I did not know that when you arrived, I would be dumb and awkward, again a learner of sound, breath, senses beyond the tips of my fingers. I did not know. I am sorry that when you cry, I finally know how to stop you, but I have to stop myself instead. I did not know I would have to teach you this, how not to need me. All right, are you doing okay? Feel free to get up and get some water. Um, so uh, partly what informed this collection was um, uh, there was a, a TV show that I saw while I was pregnant and it was on like TLC or something, you know, like the Learning Channel or it, I think it was the Learning Channel. And it was about this Moroccan woman who, um, whose name is Zara Abu Talib, and um, she uh, gave birth to a stone baby, and there is actually a medical term for this. Um, it's called a lithopedian, and I, I saw this while I was pregnant, and I was fascinated. I'd never heard of this before, um, and they have, they have records of this through um, several centuries, actually. Uh, so she's not the only one, but she kind of is the one that carried it the longest for almost half a century. Um, and the story goes that she um, she was having uh, stomach pain, and so while she was pregnant, so she went to um, the hospital in Morocco. And while she, this was in like the 1950s, and while she was there, she saw another woman die from a C-section. And so she left the hospital um, without uh, delivering a baby, without seeing a doctor. And over the next several days, she endured severe pain, um, but then it gradually subsided, and then she never delivered the baby. And in um, Moroccan culture, there's a belief that a child who is in the womb can protect a mother's honor. So she went on to adopt three children. She sort of put it out of her mind. And um, when she was much older, um, she 
uh, was diagnosed by doctors as having this stone baby. So her, ba her body had kind of like mummified the fetus. Isn't that interesting? I still, like when I tell the story, I mean, it's shocking. So um, at one point I tried to, to kind of develop this book um, to around that concept because I was, I was so interested in her life and in these beliefs and um, I tried to kind of take on a persona of hers and that didn't really work. So, um, but I did come out of that project with several poems um, that kind of talked about her experience through my eyes and uh, so I wanted to share some of those with you. The first one is called The Culture of Silence. The ultimate culture of silence. My bad. The ultimate culture of silence is a woman who swallows her baby whole without chewing or tasting, without much effort. Zara licked her lips then salted the bones. She sucked a lime just before downing the entire creature and gagged a little, the way a snake chokes down a mouse, fur and all, bone and whisker and small, delicate paw. What of it, you ask? The creature, what of the creature? Ah, yes, of course, the creature. It was not chewable. She would have broken her teeth on it, for women's teeth cannot chew through bone, even the bendable bones of the unborn. Women's jaws do not stretch that wide, do not unhinge to enlarge, not like women's hips. All that I tell you is the truth that I made up because women do not speak of these things. They leave them to us to imagine and they themselves put them out of mind, the eaten, the undigested, the makers of mothers. This next one is called Zara Abu Talib with Child, Morocco, 1955. She is the cycle of seasons on a time-lapse film, the opening buds of trumpet vines, coiled clusters of rock rose, the African daisy hosting bees. She is pollen drifting, a pregnant spring river careening a small stone downstream to the sea. Swelling in summer heat, she barrels outward into olive groves, the leathered eucalyptus, bare skin browning against breeze. She blooms, she overblooms. She loses some petals blown down on the wind before a larger storm. At her fullest, she smells of mint and myrrh. She is not a cut flower to take home and cradle on the kitchen sill, but becomes the trees as they undress, throwing their leaves onto the forest floor. A rotting stench of damp and overripe olives, a hardened pit. When winter freezes any glory and mess in fall's late harvest. Then she is only the bare branches of a lone tree, a sudden slender silhouette. I'm gonna read you one more of those. Um, this one is called Stone Fruit. She was stone-born, excavated from you, a kind of quarry, a kind of cemetery and hearse and tomb. Speaking of which, tomb rhymes with womb, and catacomb should, but of course it does not. If wombs can become tombs, then fetus can become mummy or prisoner or jar of preserves, peach, plum, preemie, stone fruit. I imagine a foreign doctor told you in an unknown language and that you were sitting in an uncomfortable chair looking at a stain on the carpet or the ceiling. I imagine you pressing her hardened hand to your sagging chest, you saying, we, 
you steadying your heartbeat like a metronome, like a dirge for a whole harvest lost. Um, so, yeah, okay. Um, I thought I'd wrap up today by um, reading a few poems that are about trips because spring break nears for the college. Um, and I thought these would be kind of like a happy way to end. But when I was um, practicing them, they're not that happy. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm kind of, it's, a good, it's a good realistic check because I am going to be driving a lot of hours in the car with my family um, next weekend. So yeah. Um, but they are, you know, they're about trips. And often trips maybe teach us that we should be grateful for being home. It's not always like, you know, the commercials, the sandals commercials. <laughs> this time of year, aren't you all so, what's the word, um, susceptible to those? I am. No, I know, Barb, not you, but. Um, so this first one is called Family Trip. We left on Saturday morning after cleaning the house, packed as much as we could think to, helped our neighbors move the guest bed and a crib, fed and watered the dog the cats. Three hours in, we found a meager park, ate flattened sandwiches and browning bananas between swigs of cranberry juice, while dusk descended and two teenage boys shot baskets into a chain link net. By dinner time, I snapped something mean at you during our final fill up at a dirty station. Ask for forgiveness a few miles later finished the cranberry juice, dregs like blood clots in the plastic bottle. Doesn't that just make you want to travel? <laughs> I had good intentions. I really did. Um, and this one is called Family Trip 2. These happen to be sonnets, if that makes it any better. On vacation, we took our daughter gently south to search for spring, past frames of buzzing pasture sweetened by authentic cows. And the first night, food poisoning from a meeting sandwich confined us to a Best Western next to the Pony Keg Express. By midweek, we had read a museum plaque about an escaped slave who, after crossing the Ohio River and being captured, killed her two-year-old daughter to free her. The whistle and torment of her story swarmed inside us as we swam with our own daughter in a hotel pool, 82 degrees warm, pleasing as copper. Returning to our neighborhood a lifelong week later, we cleaned out the car a private cemetery of buried brochures, receipts of fear dispelled, and shiny souvenirs to strap to our lasting sorrow. Um, all right, Montana. I have two more poems for you. The last reading I did, so the, somebody said, you're supposed to give a two-poem a two poem warning, which I had never heard of before. So this is your two-poem warning. I don't know what I'm warning you of, but. Montana, I almost lost all of the lives I am responsible for in Montana. The red truck's dual rear tires were inches from our small white car that held my daughter, myself, my belly full with the one who would become a son. The expanse of starless sky was gaudy, the driver artificially unrepentant. He sped away into a blue night that we drove all the way through, rotting motels with burned out letters where vans labeled girls, girls, girls grouped, stinking refineries that glowed green, the crumbled hills wanting steepness, the bridge on our plate gathered rust and putty. On the other side, into the next state's signs and invitations, I pressed, full of hate, tailing him to escape. 
Hope I didn't ruin Montana for you. <laughs> All right, I'll end with this poem, I think, to give some time for questions, or I guess requests. <laughs> Is that a thing? <laughs> Request a poem? Um, and I chose this one to finish with because, um, for now anyway, because uh, it's also kind of like a spring poem. It's a trout fishing poem, um, which happens in April, but we're almost there, right? Mm -hmm. Apology to my brother for hooking your eye with a fishing lure when I was nine. Dad had just told me not to, and so it was all I could focus on. Like that morning in the grocery store when he said, are you sure you have it? Before he dropped the tomatoes into the plastic bag I held and I had to let go. Ripe tomatoes splatting on the laminate floor of Carter's family market. Saying not to do something carves out a possibility. Every caution can mutate into a dare. I never meant to hurt you or even to scare you, just to play the incredible odds. The trout we searched for all morning were bigger, made for hooks, and none of us had even caught a silver flicker. Now, when you teach your longtime girlfriend to fish in faraway streams that only you know, do you flinch as she reaches back, focused only forward as you stand somewhere behind? unattached. Thank you. Thank you for your listening. Thank you so much. You were such a, you were such a, um, a good audience. Um, so if there's any questions, right? This is the question and answer period. Sorry. So when you attempt to write a poem, I mean, not knowing much about it myself, how do you start? I mean, with, and is, it, um, is it the music of the words that you're looking for? Is it the subject matter? Uh, how do you approach starting to write a poem? Thanks, Keith, for the question. Um, for me, I think it's the image. So it's a, I tell my creative writing students at the beginning of the semester to like try to um, <clears throat> keep a notebook with images, try to become more aware of the world around them, um, and to, um, to record things that stop you in your tracks, and that there should be those things every day. If you pay attention, they're there. Um, but so often we just sort of like move through the world onto the next thing. So for me, it's one of those things which is usually, not always, but usually an image um, or a snippet of conversation or a contrast, which to me is also kind of image-based or visual. Um, and then from there, it's kind of putting that um, down on paper and playing around with lines and line breaks to... Um, to sort of like pluck the meaning a little bit more so it resonates more. Hi, I'm Gabby. Um, I'm not a student here. Came with one of my friends who is. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned that one of your poems was a sonnet and I was wondering um, in reading this one too, how you kind of go about deciding the re relationship between the form and the content. When I write, it's kind of just like, I do what feels natural, I guess, kind of like an organic form. Um, and I've never really tried to write in like sonnet or like iambic pentameter. So I was just wondering how those forms like become fruitful for you. That's a great question. You should be a student here. 
take my class. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, for, for me, it's about trying them out. It's a trial and error piece. And it's often, um, uh, it's often something kind of like this, um, where you have to kind of keep pushing something to the edge. And it's like, when, I, when it falls off, I know, OK, I've hit a line. Um, I haven't found a way for it to be um, much more efficient. <laughs> um, I certainly have uh, forms that I find easier, and maybe that's what you mean by kind of like feeling it out and, and forms that r really intimidate me um, that seem like a big challenge to take on. Um, but I, I think those are good challenges and good goals. I'm always surprised how true it is when you write within a form how there is this sense of freedom, um, sometimes more so than just putting a poem anywhere across the page, um, which sounds oxymoronic, but yeah. So I'm sorry, all I have is trial and error. But in my classroom, I have lots of really good exercises, so I'd love to see you, Gabby. I'm curious about how do you know when you're done? How do you know when to stop <laughs> fiddling and editing and writing and testing and reading out loud? I don't know, Moss. I think you know I don't know that. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, for me, I have to step away from it for a, like a long time. I mean, I uh, usually will write something, fiddle with it until I think it's it's worth something, worth sharing with my writing group, and then I'll share it with my writing group, and they say something, and I put it away for several months or a year, and then I come back to it, and I, um, at that point, for me, time is how I'm able to see it as a reader, and that is usually when I am able to say, oh, huh, that's terrible, or so that's the, that's the part that has to stay. Um, and sometimes that's kind of like a one-time process, and sometimes there are multiple iterations of that, which does mean kind of a long time. Um, that's usually how it goes for me. Thanks for the question. Um, how did you come up with the title of Quiet Woman? Is there a story behind that? Or? Mm -hmm. um, Somebody, I had lots of different titles, and they all, I felt like students, you know how students always say, I can't think of a title, and I thought, well, I could not think of a title, um, but this, this um, it's the last poem in the book, Quiet Women, and I was going to title the book Quiet Women, and um, one of the readers that read um, a later manuscript draft said um, to consider changing it to Quiet Woman, because even though there were, um, multiple voices in the book. There was sort of a, um, how should I say this, one like sensibility or one, um, it was almost like they belonged to the same uh, speaker. And so um, I liked that concept. I didn't think I'd have to explain it though. <laughs> no, it's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, and some of the experiences are mine, and some of them are other people. You know, there's several poems in there about my, or a couple poems about my grandmothers, and um, but I think they're all. It's all filtered, filtered through that that like single sensibility, maybe. Thanks for the question. Um, if your poems were like, are all of your poems written over time? Or did you write some of them in like all one sitting? And if so, like what inspired you to make your book? So that's like three questions, right? <laughs> um, most of them are kind of like roughed out, I would say, over one period of time. When I, so I'll record like these images that I'm talking about or, or um, things that stop me in my tracks. 
Um, and then when I go to put them down you know, in the shape of a poem, I'll uh, create kind of like a rough copy. And it usually, sh um, it's pretty clear from that point whether I have enough for a poem or whether it's like two lines of an image. And occasionally then I'll have pages of just these two lines and sometimes it's like, hey, they're, these are starting to group up as a family. Um, but so when it, when it comes together, I think on a, um, when I when I get that like rough kind of roughed out poem, then I I leave it alone for a little while and then come back to it. I would say most of them are um, takes take a, quite a bit of time, not of actual work time, <laughs> more like uh, more like they're in like a crock pot or something, <laughs> you know. Um, are you working on anything for the future? Did, the did Taylor tell you to ask that question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so obvious, Taylor. <laughs> um, thank you, though, for asking. I am, actually. <clears throat> um, I'm working on another collection that's not very ha pleasant or happy. <laughs> so we'll try to release that in the summer, maybe. Not this summer, but it would not be a good February book. The subtitle is The Dread Collection, so... Yeah, but I am. In fact, getting this um, collected and published, this manuscript kind of finished, I think the reason, uh, this might be more of an answer, a follow-up to your second or third question. Um, I knew it was done, or pretty close to done, because the poems that I started writing um, didn't fit in this anymore. And for a while, everything I wrote, I was like, well, this is going to be like a 600-page book. And then all of a sudden, they didn't go. And so that was a nice feeling and um, kind of the start of a new project. Hi, Mr. Lyons. I'm an old man, and I don't know much about poetry, but I'd like to say a couple things. One is that what was said by your student that was read prior at the beginning of this thing speaks uh, a lot about you and, and it tells me what I think is very important, uh, a teacher's role in inspiring their students and, uh, and uh, getting them to be able to express themselves it, because for me, the ability to express our feelings and our, what we think is, is difficult. And, and uh, we, try, we try, but that ability to do that is, is uh, maybe God-given, I, I don't know, but, uh, or is, but it certainly is partially learned mm. yes. and, and done by practice. And I think one of the things that we're lacking in our society today is the lack of communications between people and the humanity of, of all people and the, and the ability for us to sit down and express our feelings and, and, and either in writing or orally and, and it was fact and science and value systems and, and data and whatever else so that we talk to each other intelligently and that we and that we can solve problems by by uh, being open and, and listening to other people thank you yes absolutely thank you we have maybe one more question Oh, I'm sorry. We'll have one more question, and then um, Katie is going to be available to sign books. Where was the hand? Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> is there a significance behind, like, the sadness or, like, the melancholy in your poems? 
What sadness? <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, yes. I don't know how to answer that. That's an interesting question. Um, I think that part of a poet's job is to reflect or to mirror back what, um, what they see and what they also experience. So um, after I had children, the world became a very sad place even when it was happy sometimes. It's like just seeing all the, um, you just see everything so differently. And I think that's a big driver um, through a lot of that undercurrent. I also read something that, um, uh, there's a, it's a trait in Eastern European um, poets, like um, Wisława Szymborska. Um, that uh, to combine humor and melancholy. And um, my, my family is like entirely Polish, like everybody, both sides. So I don't know if that's part of it, because um, sometimes I notice when I, when I read, some people laugh, and I didn't mean that line to be funny. But when I look back, when I hear people laugh, I'm like, oh, that is kind of funny. But it's more the contrast that I was drawn to. So I don't know if I answered your question, but that's what I got right now. Yeah, right, thank well, you. Thanks, everybody. Let's give Katie one last hand. Thank you.